the dollar has replaced gold entirely, and gold is now just a pet rock. I mean, they all—they've all bought into this. Have you talked? To, you know, just look at the policies of the Bank of Japan. They are thoroughly Keynesian in their approach. Um, you know, they don't realize what is actually happening to their own currencies. They don't see the danger. It's just like. The people who are last to understand it are the people who actually use the currencies for day-to-day -day transactions. They will eventually wake up to what the foreigners have already woken up to and already decided that they don't want to have a part of. I mean, so um, I think our central banks are yet to go on to that journey. Now, having said that, um, the few central bankers that I've talked to, um, they don't dismiss my argument I think it causes them pause for thought, but I don't think they've got to the point where they really begin to understand it. In this video, we'll explore McLeod's perspectives on the declining value of fiat currencies, the strategic movements of central banks, particularly China, and the broader implications for the global economy. Stay tuned for an in-depth analysis that will enhance your understanding of the shifting financial landscape. Alas Dare McLeod opens by emphasizing a crucial point. It's not that gold is rising but rather that paper currencies are losing their purchasing power. This decline in fiat currency value is a critical concept understood by many outside the Western financial sphere, particularly in Asia, where gold is viewed as real money. In contrast, Western nations, deeply entrenched in fiat currency systems like the dollar, euro, sterling, and yen, fail to grasp this reality. McLeod explains that as the purchasing power of these paper currencies diminishes, it's becoming increasingly serious. The Western alliance, or what he refers to as the currency alliance, remains oblivious to this decline. According to economic theory, once people understand the true devaluation of their currencies, those currencies will be effectively dead. This journey has already begun, with foreigners leading the understanding because they often hold or are asked to hold paper currencies that are not their own. These currencies represent someone else's credit, and hence, are viewed with skepticism. A pivotal example is the People's Bank of China, which has been selling dollars. McLeod points out that they are not merely buying gold, they are actively divesting from dollars, the primary currency in the global system. This action by China is a significant driver of the gold market. Central banks, particularly within the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS Plus, are moving away from the dollar as much as possible, adjusting their reserves by selling dollars and euros and purchasing gold. McLeod notes that foreign central bankers recognize the U.S.'s use of the dollar as an economic weapon. This recognition is crucial, especially for countries considering joining BRICS, as they face potential American economic retaliation, such as dollar weaponization or engineered political instability. The primary goal for these nations is to distance themselves from the dollar, and by extension, the entire fiat currency system. Western central banks, McLeod argues, have completely embraced the dollar, neglecting gold, which they consider obsolete. This perspective is evident in the policies of central banks like the Bank of Japan, which adhere to Keynesian principles and fail to recognize the dangers to their own currencies. The real awakening will occur when the general populace in these countries realizes what foreign investors have already understood. Before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more expert insights and analysis. The first thing uh, which um, the first point I must make is that it's not so much gold rising as paper currencies losing their purchasing power. And I think that's a very important point to understand. And this is particularly understood by foreigners, if I can if I can sort of, you know, put everybody in that category who actually does understand this. And I'm particularly referring to Asians, Chinese, um, maybe even some Indians. Um, who actually realize that gold is real money, to them anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, the paper is just something transient. So, um, you know, it's, it's the fiat currencies going down. That's the background to, to what we're seeing. And it's actually, it's actually getting quite serious. I mean, the, the thing that's so interesting is that um, People in the Western Alliance, which if I can call them that, you know, let, let's, let's call it the currency alliance, you know, dollars, euros, sterling, yen, whatever. They don't understand this at all. The moment they do, then according to economic theory, basically the currencies are dead. They've had it. <laughs> so so that's, that's the, the, the journey, the end of the journey in which we have started. But the people who do understand this, of course, are foreigners, because foreigners 
um, either own or are being asked to own paper currencies which are not currencies which they use day to day. They are someone else's credit, in effect. And so they take a very different view of these things. And what we're seeing, I mean, I think the People's Bank of China is a very good example. Um, what the People's Bank of China have been doing is they've been selling dollars. But what do they sell the dollars for? Other currencies? Well, no, the dollar is the top currency. They sell it for real money, which is gold. And so, it, you know, when you grasp the concept that actually what the Bank of China is doing is selling dollars, not by, you know, not buying gold as such, the emphasis being on selling dollar, then you understand what's driving the the gold market. Woken up quite a few people. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's woken up people in the central banks as such, because I think central banks have taken this view that um, the dollar is less useful than it has been. Um, it is being sold by foreigners generally. And if you look at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and BRICS Plus and all the rest of it, you can see that um, it, the policy basically is to do away with dollars as much as possible. So um, this is something which, from the central bank's point of view, they need to adjust their reserves to take account of this. So they are selling dollars, they're selling euros, and they are buying gold. Um, but you know, if you're a central banker in a foreign central bank, yes, I mean, you look at this and you think, um, you know what they've done with Russia. Well, that's not nothing. That's not anything terribly new. The Americans behave like this anyway, um, but it does re you know reinforce the point that the dollar can be used as a weapon, uh, as an economic weapon, and is and the Americans have no hesitation in doing so if the circumstances permit. Uh, and um, for anyone thinking of joining BRICS, you know they one of the threats that they face is. Um, American provocation, um, uh, you know, whether it's it's weaponizing the dollar or by engineering a coup d'etat, which apparently the Americans do. I'm not making any accusations. <laughs> you can see that uh, this is, um, uh, yeah, I mean, all these factors feed into it. But, you know, it boils down to the same thing. Yeah, you know, they don't want dollars. I mean, it's not that so much, and this is this is the point I'm trying to make. It's not so much they're buying gold. They're trying to get out of dollars. They're trying to get out of anything that is related to dollars, which basically is the whole of the fiat currency um, system. You know, the point about the, the Western Alliance is the Western Alliance, um, you know, which is sort of embraced wholeheartedly uh, that the dollar has replaced gold entirely and gold is now just a pet rock. I mean, they all, they've all bought into this. If you talk to, you know, just look at the policies of the Bank of Japan. They are thoroughly Keynesian in their approach. Um, you know, they don't realize what is actually happening to their own currencies. They don't see the danger. It's just like the people who are last to understand it are the people who actually use the currencies for day to day transactions. They will eventually wake up to what the foreigners have already woken up to and already decided that they don't want to have a part of. I mean, so um, I think our central banks are yet to go on to that journey. Now, having said that, um, the few central bankers that I've talked to, um, they don't dismiss my argument. I think it causes them pause for thought, but I don't think they've got to the point where they really begin to understand it. Because apart from anything else, from their point of view, it's a horrific conclusion. It really is. Um, I, you know, it means, and, and particularly for America, uh, the Americans, um, uh, it, so far as I can see, do not have the gold which uh, they claim to have. Now, I think the evidence of this we saw in their treatment of Germany when Germany wanted a small part of her gold repatriated. Uh, and not only that, but if you go back to um, uh, the last uh, century, um, you know, when when gold was used, if you like, um, uh, in, you know, as a, uh, it was leased, as it were, as part of the um, as, as an arrangement whereby you could you could lease gold at one and a half, two percent and then sell it into the market uh, and go and buy um, six month treasuries at uh, T-bills rather at something like six percent, seven percent, eight percent yield. I mean, we're going back into the mid 80s and into the early 90s. Um, uh, 
So that carry trade, that was the original carry trade. And of course, um, this gold disappeared. And as a, an, an analyst called Frank Venerosa put it in, in Lima in the year 2002, he'd done a lot of research on this, on this uh, um, gold leasing thing. In his discussions with central bankers, McLeod finds that while they do not dismiss his arguments outright, they haven't fully grasped the horrific implications for their currencies. Particularly in the U.S., there are suspicions about the true gold holdings, both of its own reserves and those held on behalf of other countries. Historical practices, like gold leasing, have left significant gaps in the actual gold reserves, with much of it potentially no longer in physical possession but rather in jewelry and other forms. Members of the London Bullion Market Association and traders on the short side of the comics market have also been slow to recognize these changes. They are accustomed to trading gold in a relatively stable market, but this dynamic is shifting as the global financial landscape evolves. McLeod highlights the behavior of Chinese savers, who account for a significant portion of China's GDP. With limited investment options, many are turning to gold accounts offered by banks. This trend, driven by a lack of attractive alternatives like property or stock markets, indicates a growing domestic demand for gold. Although the available gold supply cannot meet this potential demand fully, the pressure to invest in gold and silver is mounting. He reckoned up to 10 to 15,000 tons of this gold had been leased out from central banks and had disappeared, effectively being worn, as he put it, by around the next... Uh, you know, as ornamentation of Asian ladies. So, um, you know, there is this huge, great hole in uh, central bank numbers, gold holdings. And looking at it, I can only conclude that that big hole is actually in the US holdings. The US holdings, not only of its own gold, but also the earmarked gold held on behalf of other central banks. So, um, I think the whole of our system is just doesn't understand this at all. And also, if you talk to people, members of the of the London Bullion Market Association, um, the people who um, uh, are on the short side in COMEX, um, they don't really realize this either because they've made their living out of trading something um, which, you know, wasn't really going up in value or it might go up in value, but it would come down in value. They could manipulate it. But this is now changing. This is the whole thing. And if I can just um, give you another example of where this is really going, um, look at it from the point of view of the Chinese savers. Now, Chinese savers fully uh, amount to something like 35% of, of China's GDP. I'm talking about household savers. These are the individuals, if you like. Now, that's the equivalent of $6 trillion. Now, where does it go? It's no longer going into property. The stock market is not attractive. Yeah, the stock market's not attractive. Um, and uh, uh, they can't put it into anything abroad, really. So what do they do? I mean, at the moment, it's all on bank deposit. But the banks do offer, and this was something which uh, was promoted by uh, the government. They instructed the banks, in effect, to do this, uh, to offer gold accounts. So if you've got a minimum of, say, five or six hundred yuan, you can open a gold account at your bank so that you can have some of your money, say, on deposit and some of your money uh, invested in gold. Now, if I can just sort of say without all those alternatives, I mean, the property markets had it and so on and so forth. We're looking at the equivalent of 75 trillion tons of gold in savings every year. Now, obviously, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I mean, for a start, there isn't 75,000 tons of gold available uh, for uh, this to meet anything, you know, any sort of demand like that. But um, you can see that the pressure for investing in gold and also silver, incidentally, uh, just from um, Chinese citizens is really ramping up. He further illustrates this point by discussing the behavior of ETFs, which often reflects the sentiment at the bottom of a bear market. As prices hit new highs, public sentiment and market behavior suggest an impending shift. When people begin to understand that it's not just the prices of goods and services rising but their currency's value falling, they will gravitate towards gold and silver, the only bull markets in town. McLeod predicts significant market shifts, with higher bond yields leading to a bear market in equities and a rotation into assets like mines and minerals. This shift will be fascinating, with limited stock available for investment and a need for more analysts and information in the mining sector. 
you know, when when I sort of think it through in terms of this sort of you know foreign in, foreign uh, uh, approach to investment or uh, uh, credit risk and domestic uh, views of credit risk, and then transfer that onto the sort of Western alliance versus the the huge great Asian hegemon block and all the rest of it, we can find. I mean, you know, the three of us. Um, are experienced in financial markets and in investment. Okay, this sort of behaviour we're getting in ETFs is the sort of behaviour you get at the bottom of uh, of a bear market. Um, you know, this is this is the last gasp, basically. You know, the the the, um, the unwashed public basically selling out, having lost loads and loads of dosh. But here we are seeing exactly the same phenomenon. Right, uh, you know, when prices are going into new highs. At some stage, this sentiment is going to turn round, and it'll turn round when people begin to realise that perhaps it's not prices of goods and services rising, but perhaps my money's going down. You know, by money I mean credit. You know, the currency. And uh, the moment they start latching onto that, they begin to understand a little bit about why gold and silver are rising. And also, of course, they will be attracted by the only bull market in town because part of the whole scenario, which is evolving, is that if you've got people in uh, the Asian block, as it were, turning sellers of U.S. Treasuries, then the yield curve is going to go sharply positive, and goodness knows what sort of level of yield uh, the US government is going to be financing its deficit, which incidentally will be considerably larger than uh, the Congressional Budget Office tells us. So, um, you know, if you put all these things together, you can see that the market shifts are going to be very, very remarkable. I mean, higher bond yields means nasty bear market in equities. It means there's going to be a rotation out of anything which they've made money in so far which will suddenly turn quite sharply into loss making, into uh, mines, minerals, um, you know, oils, whatever, whatever, you know, or the whole of the mining complex is suddenly going to get terribly interesting. And there's not a lot of stock around. I mean, you've got a few leading companies, which obviously the investment management industry can buy quite easily because they don't have to think about it too hard. But where are the analysts? You know, where's 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 the information? I, you, you know, this is going to be a, it's going to be a fascinating shift. And I think anyone who um, is late in that one. <laughs>